this is Scottish Independence Podcast, episode number 104. And this is going to be one of those episodes where I present to you a talk that was given. This talk was given by Ivan McKee on March the 6th. Now, you may remember Ivan being on this show and also in the run-up to the referendum was going around the country giving a lecture on the economics of independence, which became very well known. This can be considered something of an update to that. There's a lot of new stuff in there and things about the direction where Ivan feels we need to be moving in order to make sure that the next time the independence question comes up, everything's nailed on. It's a very good talk and there's a good Q&A at the end. Um, We'll go to it in a minute, but just first, here's a little word from our sponsors. Yeah, that's right. We don't have any sponsors. But anyway, here's the talk from Ivan, and I'll have a wee word with you at the end. So now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker for tonight, Mr. Ivan McKee, who'll give us an insight into the world of business and what it means to us. Thank you. Thanks very much. Can Can you hear me? Is this microphone working? Oh, it's working. It's working. I should, I should do. I'm all wired up here. I've got a thing on for the video and another thing for the microphone and, and whatever. So, um, well, thanks very much. Really enjoyed it. Uh, really enjoyed the music. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm going to talk to you for about half an hour or so. Um, a mixture of stuff I've done before and some new material, as they say. So, um, hopefully, I'll go through without any any hitches. Plenty of time after that for. Q&A, so hopefully you'll, uh, you'll enjoy it. I'm going to talk mainly about austerity uh, at the beginning and then a bit about um, Scotland's economy, different strengths in Scotland's economy, um, and touch on a few other subjects along the way. So it's fairly broad range and hopefully it hits on a lot of things that are interesting people just now. So yeah, as I say, a wee bit about where we are post-referendum and how things kind of look from a political point of view in the broadest sense. Going to talk about austerity, touch on the banks uh, that was mentioned, um, alternatives to austerity, what Scotland contributes to the UK, where things are going to go, Westminster and Holyrood potentially, and then a bit about Scotland's economy. So, so quite broad ranging, um, and we'll see how it goes. So, a bit about me. I've been working in manufacturing since I graduated from Strathclyde, which is now 30 years ago and counting. Uh, the last 10 years working running my own businesses. And I'm doing stuff internationally. I've worked, worked all over the place in the last uh, the last number of years, including periods in some Scandinavian countries, which really opened my eyes as to what a successful small European independent country could uh, could look like. When the referendum came along, I kind of got involved with stuff and got sucked in, and ended up doing a world tour of Scotland over about a year, which took me to about 85 different different venues, which was wonderful. So some. Tremendous places, all the way from Orkney in the middle of the summer, which you can't beat, um, Sky, Isla, some fabulous parts of the country. Um, so I did that, and then uh, I think it involved in the Commonwealth with Robin McAlpine post, post the referendum, so I've been, I've been working with them, getting involved in a few other political things since then as well. So I'm not an economist, I come at it from a very practical, if this was my business point of view, what does it look like, um, and, and go and check the numbers in a bit of detail. So hopefully it's something that um, you can relate to. So in terms of where we are, clearly the, 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 the referendum went up the no vote, which means we're in the union, right? A lot of people forget that. So why are these Scots coming down here and telling us what to do? Well, it's because there was a no vote. If there'd been a yes vote, we'd be off doing something different. David Cameron has said we're well, an equal partner in that uh, family of nations. And the Scottish uh, representation, the SNP or whatever, uh, from a pro independence point of view in Westminster, um, will be there to play a constructive role in running the UK because, frankly, we're part of it and we're going to make the most of it while we're there. And people forget Scotland needs a strong UK, whether we're part of it or not part of it, it's going to be our biggest trading partner um, and it's important that the UK or our UK in the future potentially is, uh, is successful. Um, and that's an important point to get across. So I think it's not. Sometimes it's looked upon as a, a destructive element, all these tartan boards going down south. The reality is quite the opposite, we need to make it work. And I want to talk about some of the stuff that alternatives to austerity, where there is a very coherent programme, which uh, is frankly what I think the UK in, in its entirety needs. 
So when you talk about austerity, it's one of these words that gets thrown about and people talk about it all the time and everybody hates it, right? And you say, well, what is it? Describe it to me. And it kind of works at two levels when you dig into it. There's a lot of people who say, well, it's the cuts and I don't like the cuts. And that's absolutely fair enough because it's um, destruction of public services, it's tax on the vulnerable, uh, it's all of that stuff which we're instinctively uh, repelled by. But clearly there's a lot more to it than that from an economic point of view which is mainly what I'm going to touch on tonight, but I'm going to, going to look at it from both points of view. Because the whole austerity thing rests on an economic theory that frankly was debunked decades ago, but keeps rearing its, its ugly head again. And I'll kind of talk you through that in a bit, deconstruct that in a bit of detail. It comes back to this kind of balancing the, the budget uh, as it's described, and it ignores the, the need in an economy for growth, which is back to the Keynesian thing, which I, I did a year of economics at university back in the 80s and at that point it was kind of like Keynes had debunked all this nonsense back in the 30s and the 40s but it keeps coming back and uh, I'll go through that in a bit of detail talk about um, everybody's favourite uh, politician <laughs> Mrs Thatcher said this back in the, in the 70s or the 80s any woman that understands the problems of running a, a home will be nearer to understanding the problems of running a country which is one of the most ridiculous pieces of nonsense anybody's ever said. But yeah, that's, that, was, uh, that was where she was coming from at the time. Because if you look at a household, you know, personal finances, the way it works is you've got money coming in, you've got money going out, and you've got what you've got left or not got left, depending on how much you spend. And you might have debt or not, or you might have some money in the bank or not. And that's kind of the way it works. It's kind of a straightforward, linear thing. When you're running an economy, it's completely different. And it's completely different because there's this loop, loop here, this feedback loop, because a lot of the expenditure ends up coming back in as income. And I'll kind of talk you through how that works and explain what that process is all about. And that's the fundamental difference that they kind of forget when they're talking about you've got to balance the books, you've got to run it like it was a household. Because basically what happens is if you've got an economy, a national economy, and you put money into that through investment, and that can be through infrastructure, roads, house building, a whole range of stuff, which talk about more as we go through. What that does is at least the more people get employed. And more people get employed means there's less people in benefits and there's more people paying taxes. And that means there's more people that have got money to spend in the economy in the corner shops, which means that they're employed, more people and more businesses are opening, uh, which means there's more people with money and more people who are spending money and they're spending more money, which means more people are getting employed, etc, etc, etc. So you get into that virtuous circle, if you like, where the economy is growing and things are healthy, as opposed to where we've been for most of the past five or six years, which is the opposite, where we're cutting um, and getting into more of a more of a spiral. And I'll show you some of the, the numbers on that um, as as we go through. So that's the fundamental concept. It's kind of straightforward. Clearly, there's other stuff round about it in terms of how fast you grow, how much investment you put in, where you direct that investment to and a whole range of things that need to be managed effectively to make it work. But conceptually, that's, that's, that's the fundamental basis of the whole thing. So let's have a few graphs now on some data round about on what's happened over the past few years. I've got it George Osborne's record. It's only the tail end of, of Alistair Darling going into um, what George Osborne has, uh, has done. Um, because if you remember, the Tories came in in 2010, the first budget in June 2010, <coughs> They laid out a bunch of uh, economic plans for the recovery and talked about the way those numbers would pan out. So what I've done is taken that set of numbers and compared them as to what actually happened over the, the five years. So they talked about deficit reduction plan, which was to get rid of the, the, well, the deficit, the current account deficit by 2015-16 and the deficit in its entirety by the following year. So by the end of the Parliament, they wanted to get basically rid of the deficit. So basically what that means is deficit, except for the investment part of it, which was about 20 billion, would, uh, would go to zero. And that's that blue line there. The reality is they missed that, and missed that by quite a long way. They missed about 50 billion um, per year. And which in the headline, it's like, okay, a politician makes promises um, and they miss their promises. No big surprise there. But the interesting part is why they've missed it, which I'm going to go and talk to in a minute. Before we forget about the difference between the deficit and the debt, the deficit is the amount, the difference between what you, uh, your income and your expenditure in any given year. The debt is accumulation of all the deficits. So the fact that we've still got a positive deficit or spending more 
the environment means that the, the debt continues continues to go up. So the fact that the deficit is coming down doesn't mean that the debt isn't still obviously going up. So there's two parts to it. Let's look at spend. The spend lines are almost um, identical. What he said five years ago he was going to do in terms of cutting investment, cutting public services, is pretty much what they've delivered. And actually fact they've cut slightly more than they said they were going to do. So that part of it achieved his, his plan. That line's kind of gone up, but you've got to remember we've got inflation over that period, etc., etc. But you put it as a percentage of the economy, spend's going down. So the amount of money it's been spent on public services and investment over that five-year period in terms of the whole economy as a percentage has been going down, and that's where the cuts, as we see them, have been, uh, have been taking place. So it's high spend numbers, what's going on? Missed the deficit target, debt's still going up, spending cuts as he planned for them, delivered, but keeps missing the deficit target. Well, the reason is because they missed their income target, okay? And this is where it gets interesting. The blue line is the plan for national income, which is all your tax income. And the red line is the actual. So there's quite a gap there, and that's the reason why the deficit hasn't come down as much as you thought. And if you think about it, the bits they can control in terms of how much they're spending, they've done what they said they're going to do, the bit they can't, they didn't control, don't control, how much tax people are paying is a bit they missed. And then you think a wee bit deeper into that, and it's a very complicated graph, because I stole it from somebody else, but you only want to look at two lines, the, uh, the yellow line at the top and the, the green line at the bottom, and ignore all the stuff in the middle. And just to explain what this is, this is a graph that shows the percentage of the total income of individuals, how much of it gets uh, taken in income tax and national insurance. So you think about it, people that are uh, below the minimum tax threshold don't pay any tax, people above that are paying 20%, plus they're paying national insurance, and as you go higher up you're paying 40%, 45%. So there's a whole range mixture of what income tax rates individuals are, are paying. This is a, a number that basically takes total income of everybody in the country and divides it by the total tax take, income tax plus national insurance. So it's effectively the average, the average tax rate everybody in the country is paying combined tax and national insurance. And if you look at that, it was 34% back in 2009-10 uh, when they took over. And the projection was it would go up, the percentage would go up, they'd be taking a bigger percentage of tax from people as, uh, as time went on. Not because they put tax rates up, but because on average people would earn more and move up the tax bands. Because that's what's always happened in the past. People have gone through their careers, they've earned more money, wages have gone up in general, people have moved up, people have 20% before, moved up to 40%, and the average number goes up. But the reality is it's actually going the other way, it's going down. So what does that mean? That means that rather than people earning more and paying more tax, over that period of time people have been earning less and paying less tax. And that is effectively where the, uh, the, the income gaps come from. Because the whole problem with the austerity model is that you're not investing in the economy, people aren't working, People are working, are, paying, are earning less, and are paying less tax, and that's where the gaps come from. So it kind of shows up in stark terms of fundamental flaw in the whole, the whole process. Another interesting thing to look at is the amount of that public spending to investment. Because investment is important, because if you invest in infrastructure, which is what most of that is, that's where you generate a lot of jobs very quickly. People building houses, building roads, building bridges, building railways, building whatever. You put the money in, you get a lot of jobs, and often a lot of more technical jobs, potentially high paid jobs, depending on what the project is, and that investment number's been slashed, which has had a major impact on the uh, amount of activity in the economy over that period. So you think back to the model at the start, the model basically says, you've got your income, you've got your expenditure, and a lot of your expenditure comes back into the economy's income, and investment's a key part of that. So what's happened, they've cut the spending, the consequences of that has been that income's been cut as well because of what's happened, and uh, they also slashed the investment, which has been a bit, of a bit of a disaster. So that's kind of where we're at. Now, I said at the start, there's two parts of austerity. It's about the economy and the numbers and the graphs, but it's also about the other side of that, um, which is the effect on individuals. 400% increase in use of Scottish food banks last year, according to the Trussell Trust. So investment's good for growth, good for fixing the economy, but it's also important for individuals. And it's